Well, welcome to another Reformers interview. Uh, we have Tim Challies here with us. Welcome, Tim. Welcome to Australia. Thank you. Uh, is this your first time to Australia? This is my second time to Australia. Yeah, I was here a few years ago in Sydney and over to Perth. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Excellent. And what brings you here this time? Yeah, I'm on a church history project, so I'm doing research for this project I'm developing. And over 2018, we're going to, I think, 21 or 22 different countries to uh, work on research for a book and a documentary project. Okay. Yeah. Now, you're known for blogging and your book reviews at chalice.com. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what got you into reviewing books and, and reading them? Yeah. I think I started reviewing books because people started sending me books. I had a website that some people had started reading, and so publishers mm -hmm. saw an opportunity there and started sending me books. And I think this kind of culture of book reviews grew up in the, in the Christian blogosphere and then uh, especially through my site and so the books kept coming so I just kept reviewing them and uh, have a deep love for reading love for books and so uh, really what I saw was there were a lot of pastors out there who have questions about books but don't have time to read them all okay. and I thought a service I could offer pastors is reading the books and telling them here are the best and here are the worst Excellent. And, so sorting uh, them for the pastors. right yeah that's been a lot of it sorting mm -hmm. them for busy pastors and Excellent. I hope they found that helpful that's great yeah. uh, and we were talking just before the interview started about mm -hmm. how you um, at, at times have been reviewing about a book a week and reading more than that. <laughs> yeah. um, most of us struggle to read a few books a week. Mm -hmm. How on earth do you get time to do that and how do you approach a, reading a book that helps you in, in doing that? Yeah, so reading is just a habit you got to form in all of life and I think people who don't read or say they don't have time to read, they just realize that you have to take the time from something else. So if you're not reading and you want to read more, then you've got to scale back on Netflix or gaming or yeah. some other hobby and commit it to reading. So um, I think once you get into the reading habit, you start to build the discipline, it gets easier. It's like most things. People uh, don't read very much, so they're not very good at reading, which sounds odd, but it is a skill you develop, and so they, they quit too early instead of really learning to develop the habit mm -hmm. and, and sure. start to do it as, as really almost a lifestyle of being a reader. Yeah. Are there any uh, tips you'd give to approaching a book and how to start reading? Yeah, I think there's a lot of value in the old method of skimming over it and then going back and, and yeah. deep reading. I think a lot of people get hung up on, I have to read the entire book. I think there's nothing wrong with abandoning a book halfway through if you're not enjoying it or it's not good. Just cut your losses and go find another book and read that. So uh, there's no necessary value in finishing a book, you know? And, um, I think John Piper said, books don't change people, sentences do. So mm -hmm. um, if you're reading a book and you get one solid idea out of that book, it is well worth whatever you spent on it and whatever time you gave it. So mm -hmm. and I look back at my life or things I say or things I believe, and I can often trace it, just a sentence or two to a book. There's, there's very few books where the entire book has shaped me, but often it's a line here, a line there that just goes down deep and somehow changes your life. Mm -hmm. um, and... You, you yourself are a, a blogger, and the, mm. today it seems we live in the, the age of blogs and yeah. video content. There's unended, unending um, resources out there for us in yeah. the digital world. Mm -hmm. uh, with all of that available to us, why should we even bother going to a book? It's, it's much easier to read a blog or watch a video. Yeah. I think the main benefit of books is that there's a whole development process that goes into a book. And so when people would say blogs are eventually going to replace books, they don't know what they're talking about because those are different media. Blogs are quick and urgent and largely unedited. Books go through this long, laborious process of research and writing and editorial. And so most people don't know this. When you submit a book to a publisher, it's usually six to 12 months before that book is actually released. And in that time, it's going through this very thorough process. Um, so I think books offer a much deeper, more editorialized view of a subject, where blogs are very urgent. So somebody passes away today, we can write a blog about their life tomorrow, but the more in-depth and thoughtful approach will be a year later when we've actually written a book about that. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Now, we've also got joining us uh, Akos Balog from the Gospel Coalition Australia and Mark Powell from Australian Presbyterian. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Um, we thought we'd use this opportunity to broaden the conversation from books to the Christian and social media yeah. In, yeah. more in general. Yeah, so there was one book uh, which you'd written um, mm. on this very topic, um, The Next Story, which I must say I thought was fantastic. Good. I love your mm. line before about Piper that it's not books that change you, mm. but um, sentences. Mm -hmm. And I found 
there are just a stack, a multitude of sentences in this Good. book that I just, that really went down deep. So thank you. Good, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you particularly, I, one thing I found really intriguing was the history of communication and media and how that shapes us and changes our identity. Yeah. Can you just um, recap a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah, well, we as, I mean, just as human beings are in some ways a product of our technologies. Our technologies form us. And uh, when you go back and look through human history, you see that um, great communication changes usually come about, and then there's, there's many other changes that follow on the back of them. Mm -hmm. And so you can really trace human history by these changes in modes of communication. So you go back mm -hmm. to the printing press, you go yeah. back to the telegraph, you go mm -hmm. back even to the Roman road system, which was in its own strange way a communication system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Recently we've come to the internet, this digital world, and it's really changing everything about us. Yeah. Um, and so we're just learning as we go that we think we just started, we just got in an email account, we just started to use the internet. But we, what we haven't realized is we're actually changing ourselves, changing everything about us. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's usually something we only see later through the rear view mirror. Yeah, great. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, Tim, I guess going back to that idea that it's not books that change people, but sentences and ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the ideas that I really appreciated in your book was the idea that technology is not value neutral. So a little bit of what you've been talking there, I think. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the, I guess, underlying values that are shaping the users of digital technology and social media, perhaps without them even realizing it? Yeah, well, certainly digital media is about urgency, and that's sort of what we've mm -hmm. been speaking about, that um, things can appear in an instant and get around the world in an instant. Mm -hmm. And you can think back to the, the history of some of the terrible things that have mm -hmm. happened through the Internet. Somebody puts out a tweet, and mm -hmm. very quickly, I mean, instantly, it's around the earth. Yeah. And so, um, really, the, the Internet values that urgency. Somebody was speaking to me earlier about, mm -hmm. I used to blog, but then Facebook came along. Well, blogging values some level of thoughtfulness mm -hmm. um, because it's associated with your name and you know it's going to kind of live on at your blog. Mm -hmm. Facebook values urgency because that's gone. Once you post that content there, you're probably never going to see it again. Mm -hmm. um, so again, there's a lot of urgency in the digital world that mm -hmm. is making us live faster paced lives, but I think also just reducing the amount of thought and time we ponder things before mm -hmm. we release them to the earth. Mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. So I think when you go, I love to read the Puritans and the Puritans had this way of taking a big idea and then shortening it to a mm -hmm. quick sentence. And so they were tweeting in their own way long before yeah, wow. Twitter. Mm -hmm. but I mean, you read Matthew Henry and you see he's got a paragraph and then he's got that sentence and that mm -hmm. sentence is gold. But that sentence just didn't happen. He had to put mm -hmm. tons of time into taking that idea, yeah. boiling it down to one small thing. Um, I don't think we're doing that today. We're just being urgent. We're not being thoughtful. Mm -hmm. What are some of the, uh, you talk in your book too about the idols in our hearts mm -hmm. uh, and that it sort of fuels our addiction, you know, that I must keep scrolling, you know, through. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, what, about that tension and that dynamic? Yeah, well, I think if you look at technology and the history of technology through a Christian lens, we see that technology is very closely related to idolatry. Mm -hmm. um, our technologies have a way of feeding our idolatries. And so if I really make an idol out of popularity, I love to be popular, I love to be well known and well thought of, well then our technology is very, very able and willing to help further that idolatry. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can see that usually in other people we can see how technology furthers their idolatry yeah. but of course it's also true that technology furthers noble purposes so if we're mm -hmm. truly about mm -hmm. you know we really want to see god's word go out we really want to see people encouraged yeah. technology is is willing to help us with that as well mm -hmm. and on that note i love gospel coalition australia it's one of the sites i follow read it every day mm -hmm. and i think it's a great example of using technology to reach out to a country to yeah. find group of people we want to reach them and technology is wonderful at doing that it's again it's not value neutral but on the other hand it can always be harnessed almost mm. always harnessed for real really good purposes mm. um, but we just have to have an awareness that those bad things can seep in as well so we just got to be mindful of that yeah, yeah sure mm -hmm. So I think you've sort of answered my next question, but what, what are some of the attitudes or what should be the overall attitude that Christians should have when approaching digital technology and social media? What, yeah. what should be our approach? Well, I think inevitability on one level, which is this is the world we live in. So you speak to some parents who are saying, well, I don't let my kids do this. I don't let my kids do that. Part of our parenting now is teaching our kids to use these things well. We get, you know, 18, 19 short years with our kids and then they're gone. By the time our kids are gone mm -hmm. we ought to have really trained and mentored them in how to use these things um, our kids have to be 
media savvy in some level. They have to mm. be able to use these things without completely falling apart as soon as mm. they're they're out of our purview. So um, I think that, that's a very important thing that a lot of people overlook. And then just, I think again, that sense of urgency, reducing that sense mm. of urgency. There's very little you need to say right now. For every tweet you write, delete nine out of 10 of them and you'll be a better person. The world will be better for it. Um, <laughs> You know, just be be aware that face to face communication is still better. As good as email is, as good as FaceTime is, as good as Twitter, all these things, they're all blessings. They're all mm. good. But there's something about face to face, the big promise of the gospel. We get to be yeah. face to face with Jesus Christ. We love the Bible. We're longing for the day we can be face to face, right? That's no knock on the Bible. That's just an acknowledgement that being face to face is is better. That's what we long for. And I think we've got to realize that's true of our digital communications as well. It's yeah, still better to be together. There's this fantastic chapter you have in the book about distraction. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you even mentioned an example of you're in church and there's a lady singing a song and she's on Twitter or she's yeah. on social media. Um, yeah. What do you think that's doing to us spiritually when, yeah, can you talk about that dynamic when we come to, to worship? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, when I first wrote the book, we were just in, I think the iPad had just kind of come along. And so mm. we were looking at that as a Bible replacement. Mm. And at the time, people were writing articles saying, take your paper Bible to church. That's very, very important. Um, today, that's irrelevant. I mean, you look around, especially young people, nobody's got a printed Bible anymore. It's just mm. media goes on, technology goes on. Um, but the beauty of the Bible is that really it was a single function device. Um, you'd be reading your Bible and you never, it would never buzz and a little notification about Facebook or something yeah. pop up in your Bible. It did one thing. Worst thing, you'd flip to the end and see maps, you know, and kind of lose yourself in that. But yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a one-function device and it did it well. Yeah. Our, our phones are equally good at showing us the Bible. And I love reading the Bible on my iPad, using my software for it. But I've got to be aware there's a lot else. It's not a single-function device. It's an almost infinitely functional device. And so those functions are all competing with one another. And our technology has advanced, but not to the point yet where I can now make my iPad do just one thing. So if I'm using it for all these different purposes, I need to be careful that when I want to use it for worship, when I want to use it for Bible reading, I'm committing it to just that one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a very difficult thing to do. I think lots of us can say we've been interrupted in our prayer or in our scripture reading by that very device we're using to help us pray or help yeah. us read scripture. You also mentioned skimming. You know, that whole, whole idea of when you're looking at a digital screen, it's just so easy to... Yeah, yeah, the right. Page. What's your, what is your thoughts about, I know Akos and I were talking about this before, um, about coming to church with a digital um, phone or, or iPad compared yeah. to, say, a paper book? Is, is there right. anything lost uh, by not having that hard copy? Yeah, mm. so I think a, a working definition of technology is everything that was invented after I was born, right? So, I mean, we would say the iPad is technology, but the book is technology too. Yeah. Jesus never used a book. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, the early church fathers, they didn't use books. This is a new piece of technology too. We look at the book as being the perfect technology. And since it predated us, we kind of assume it has always existed. In fact, when we think of the Bible, that's what we think of as two pieces of leather with pages between them. That's not what the Bible is, right? The Bible is the, the canon, the complete collection of God's authoritative uh, writings. So Jesus knew the Bible as scrolls, as parchments. Okay, so the point being, our kids are not going to think of the Bible as a printed artifact. They'll think of it as an app, and it'll still be God's Word, because God's Word is the, the canon, the, the collected scripture. So we're in this transition period now where we're inventing things, but we haven't really mastered them yet. We've got this great device called an iPad or called a tablet or whatever that can do many, many different things. We have to, like we're in this transition period where soon we'll learn how to use it better and we'll be able to make the Bible really function maybe a little bit better again. Mm -hmm. But again, it, it's already lost. It's already too late to say, should we go to app Bibles? Mm -hmm. we, we already have. You just look around the church now and that's what you see. So mm -hmm. um, it, there's an inevitability to it. So now let's focus on using it well, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, just on that, what are some of the, I guess, pitfalls or... Uh, mistakes that you see Christians mm. making with digi digital technology mm. again in general but also maybe if you want to talk a bit about social media that seems to yeah be a hot topic these days well I think we tend to embrace technology because very quickly because mm. we see the possibilities in it mm. but I, I talk about this in the book and this is taking from Neil Postman and Marshall McLuhan and people mm. like that which is we're very good at looking at a new technology and seeing all the great possibilities we're very bad at assessing the risk and the example I always like to use is us ditching him 
hymn books in favor of the PowerPoint screen. Mm. That was in its own way a very costly switch, but people made that switch very quickly and very thoughtlessly. What did we lose when we lost the hymnal? Mm. Is we lost this idea that we have a collection of songs that we sing and that we master, mm. and that this song is this collection of songs is semi-permanent. We only add to it very, very slowly and very thoughtfully. You know, mm. Keith Green writes in Christ Alone. It's gonna sorry, Keith Getty writes in Christ Alone. It's gonna be like 15 or 20 years before we run a new print run of our hymnal and can can add it. So. With PowerPoint, we can add it, we hear it on Wednesday, we can add it on Sunday. Mm. Maybe that just shows us what's going on in the world of technology, that mm. um, it, this happens in lots of things, including changing our print Bibles for digital Bibles. We move ahead very, very quickly without properly considering mm. the risks. Do you think about getting rid of our paper church directories in order to do a, a, an electronic version? Mm. I mean, it seemed like a very good move, saves money, saves printing costs. It also gets rid of all the old people. They don't, they're not on Facebook. They're not using their computer. So now mm -hmm. they don't have a directory. Um, churches have done a lot of things where they just haven't thought it through carefully enough. And I think there's been a cost with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one final question. Or you, uh, I'm good. Um, if there's one bit of advice you can give to families in how they're managing social media, I think a, mm -hmm. lot, of, a lot of parents are feeling like it's just gone too quickly and mm -hmm. they're playing catch up. What, yep. uh, there's an excellent section at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. Can you just sum up, what are some really helpful tips people yeah. uh, need to know? So the, the edition of the book you're looking at is the second edition, and we added that specifically, this yeah. part for families. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really because between the first and the second edition, a lot had changed in that way. So I, I said it earlier, I want to reaffirm this to parents. It is your job as a parent to teach and train your children in using technology. Mm. You can't just assume they'll get it. You can't assume they'll use it well. You must teach and train them. This is just part of your discipling of your children. Um, that means to some degree you've got to learn what they're using. You've got to keep an mm. eye on what they're doing. You've got to know the apps. You've got to maybe talk to somebody who's a little more up to date on these things. And My kids are using this app. What should I know about it? Um, teach and train your children to use them so that when they're no longer under your care, they, you can send them out confidently knowing they'll, have, they'll know how to use these things well. It's like I compare it to the car. If You don't just give your kids the keys to the car and say, off you go, learn how to use it. You, you go out and you train them. And then eventually, once they've mm -hmm. proven themselves, maybe they can take the car around the block or maybe they can drive to the shops, mm -hmm. but you're going to let, give them just incrementally more and more. And I think that's the way we have to treat devices. You wow. prove you can use this well, then I'll let you use it a little bit more. You prove you can do this, I'll let you do that. Mm -hmm. Then eventually by the time they're adults, hopefully we can just set them free confidently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thanks very much. Well, that's all we have time for. Thank you, Mark and mm -hmm. Akos for joining us. And thank you particularly to Tim. My pleasure. For your time. If you wanna know anything uh, more about what AP, mm -hmm. the Gospel Coalition, or Tim Challies <laughs> does, you can check out their websites in the link uh, in the description. Um, we hope that this interview was helpful for you, encourage you to pick up a book and read, and also to think carefully about how you approach social media, and perhaps a good way to do both of those things <laughs> is to pick up Tim Challies' book, The Next Story, which is what we've been referring to throughout this interview.